Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Well, it was an exhilarating win uh, for the Oilers. They came, you know, they're, they're the uh, last three games. They've been the cardiac kids coming back each time rather unexpectedly. It's hard to come back in the NHL. Mm-hmm. And they, they did it. They came back uh, in this game from one nothing, and then from two to one, and then they won it uh, three two in the shootout. It was a pretty strong performance by the Edmonton Oilers. They had twenty one grade A shots to fourteen for the Nashville Predators. That's our tentative uh, total at this point. And a big day for the franchise, Bruce. They take a risk both in terms of team chemistry and um, fan acceptance. In signing the, and I think it's fair to say, definitely fair to say, controversial. A lot of people are called controversial, including me uh, now and then. But this guy is really controversial, Evander Kane. Um, What are your thoughts, Bruce? We'll we'll get to the we'll get to the two good things, two bad things, the two numbers. Let's just deal with this first. Uh, What do you think? What do you think of it? What happened first? Well, it's a major roll of the dice by by the Oilers, and you know they're. uh, 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 I mean, the risk that they're taking here is on multiple levels, just given the past reputation of this player, uh, uh, because he's going to make his presence felt on the ice, potentially in the room, potentially in the arena, potentially in the community. And uh, on the ice, I think it's, a, a, as most people call it, a no-brainer that this is the sort of player that uh, uh, will give the team a boost he checks a lot of boxes that are fairly lightly checked by the existing roster in terms of his uh uh his aggressiveness and and uh general physicality but you know the whole package for power forward from you know shots hits penalties fights uh you know he's got a lot of skill he's fast he's big uh, very very uh, very flashy player uh and uh, you know from that aspect uh, for the price that they paid for him, which is no assets and, you know, a relatively small cap hit for the remainder of this season. Uh, it's hard to, to hard to see how uh, this doesn't make the owners a more dangerous team. Uh, these in the room, I mean, you and I are never probably going to know about it, but there's a lot of stories of uh, this guy having uh, um, uh, issues with teammates in the past and, and, uh, there, you know, I heard some stories today about an assistant coach who wanted to fight him, you know, and stuff like that. Like, that just what's going on now? My suspicion is, uh, and this applies to uh, uh, across the board for him, is that he will be on best behavior. I mean, this is a huge turning point, crossroads in his professional and personal life, quite frankly. And he's, you know, he's comes in here with one chance to make an impression, not just on on uh, this team, but on the hockey world, that he's still going to be a big time player and he can get his crap together and, and help the team. And his next contract, uh, big or small, may well depend on how that performance is. Uh, and as for in the arena, I stated this in an article I wrote a couple of weeks ago and I've been reading on and off from Uh, different people that I know and respect who are uh, sort of distancing themselves from the team based on uh, the uh, past history of the the guy that they just signed. And I've talked to people who said they're, you know, they think they won't renew their season tickets and, and, or, you know, if I'm just going to step back from the team for a while, there's plenty of it on Twitter today. And, that's a huge risk that they're playing, you know, they're, that they're risking alienating, you know, even if it's a five or 10% of the fan base. I mean, the polls that I saw were basically two thirds, one third. Well, one third is a lot when it's a, you know, it's a, a sort of a core fundamental issue for, for some of them. And, uh, and then finally the community is, you know, this, uh, you know, that he's coming to live in our city for a while and, Hopefully we won't have any repeats of, of uh, some of the past uh, stories. And they are stories, but there are a lot of them from a lot of different eyewitnesses and, and uh, um, uh, people, you know, that 
a lot of lawsuits and a lot of investigations, Bruce. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. It's fair to say, and, and I think it's also fair to say. I don't know if this is fair to say, but is he, is he a, like a gambling addict? Like he 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 seems to have a fundamental addiction problem here mm-hmm. that he's got to address in his life. You know, because mm-hmm. his fight, like his aside from all the behavior stuff, his finance, his financial life is a shambles, mm-hmm. and he's gone into bankruptcy and. So this is a very, he's had a very troubled life as a pro athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and as for the, you know, if the people are, if some fans are backing away because of this. I I have nothing to say about that other than like, it's ever like, I, I, I would never ar- try to argue against mm-hmm. someone doing that. Like people have got to assess this player on their own. Right. The way I look at it is I, um, I just see these as really serious charges. Some some of the allegations are super serious, and I'm, I, you know, I've uh, as I've said before, I've I've covered trials, major crimes for twenty years. At one point in my career, it was my focus as a reporter, and a couple times, I, I saw police convinced someone was guilty as hell, and they were dead wrong. They were dead wrong. And they were absolutely and utterly convinced about this, these, you know, individuals, guilt of individuals. And I was too along the way. And and what that taught me, like I, I started to just think, okay, you got to just be, before you start to assign guilt on really serious charges, you got to be careful. I have to be careful. I, my job is to be fair and accurate and not to make judgments before I have all the information. So when, when there's serious charges like there is with Cain, I think it needs to be dealt with, not in a, like, honestly, not in a Twitter free for all, but in a serious place in the courts. And and some of these things with Kane are serious enough that they're ending up in the courts. Mm-hmm. That's the proper venue for him to be judged. And when that happens, when there starts to be judgments, for instance, if there are judgments against him, then I'll put real weight in that. Until then, I, I've learned to be cautious because I can be wrong. And... um you know, the only judgment I have seen turned out in his favor where he was yes. awarded custody of his child, which is a really serious matter. It's not, this is never taken lightly. Now, maybe it was a case of the best of a bad, two bad choices. And I and I don't know. Again, I'm just guessing. But he, he was given that. So I, I do put a little bit of weight in that. And just as a general principle, I'm not against giving people chances in life. Like, I think it's important to do so. So I'm personally um, not going to back away from the team because of this although i have real questions about this this mm-hmm. individual i hope he can figure out his life because yeah, no it doesn't seem like he's done a very good job up to date although he's done a good job in one aspect he's a hell of a hockey player and that's why the edmonton Oilers signed him in terms of the Oilers, bruce of the on ice stuff now they don't have to like when they're looking they're desperate for some toughness up front often and they don't have to move up cassian anymore this cane gives them the ability to have a highly skilled player, the, you know, still at the top of his game, that they can play with McDavid or Dreisaitl. And, and when we're looking at the top lines, we, you know, you could, you could, there's going to be endless suggestions and permutations, combinations, combinations you can go with. But you have nine players in Kane, McDavid, Yamamoto, Hyman, Dreisaitl, Puglia Yarvi, Fogel, Nugent Hopkins, and I think Holloway event in, in a month or two. Nine players who are, who can who can really play top nine hockey most of those guys can you know at least seven of those guys could play uh top top two line hockey so it's a it's a very straightforward move if you if you're trying to win the stanley cup which is what the edmonton owners are doing and um this is a team that has given other people with checkered pass second chances and i know people resent it when people say that because they say well you know other other people were much more contrite, um, and and a, than than Kane is right now. Right. Although that's yet to be seen. Like I don't even know if we've heard from Kane. There's um, a long interview on TSN that I personally have not had the chance to watch yet. It's something like 35, 35 minutes long, and I'm going to try and track that down and watch the whole thing. I remember that came out with the Kyle Beach thing, where you know it wasn't until you heard the full length interview from the guy that. That you got, uh, you know, a better sense of the situation. I'm not saying this is Kyle Beach. I'm just saying this is a yeah, guy no, I'm explaining I just, to do. I'm hesitant, and, uh, honestly, believing anything Kane says. Like I, yeah, I'm, no, I'm interested I'm, to hear I'm, how he frames it. 
Yeah, fair enough, but I ain't yeah. buying it. I, I won't, like, for someone yeah. like that with this record, it has to be hard, difficult action over a long period of time that he's got to take. We'll see if he's on that path or not. So that's where I'm at. Any any other thoughts, or do you want to move on to the... Uh... Uh, well, just in terms of, I mean, with, with the, I mean, the, the most serious thing to me is the assault against women. And I know that I, a few number of the women that I follow and on Twitter and respect are, are quite taken aback, to put it mildly. Uh, and each is, each of the charges is kind of a he said, she said, but, you know, when you have several of them, it's he said, they said. And when the stories are coming in, you know, it it, it, it really, uh, really gives me great pause. Uh, he did win that custody battle with his ex-wife, who seems to have issues of her own, I think is the only takeaway we can have from what's come in from that. And, they, and they both like they had an explosive relationship. Yeah, they both alleged physical violence within yeah. the relationship. And right. Um, right. But uh, yeah. he, the one judgment that certainly did go against them was the bankruptcy. And it was, you know, twenty six million dollars. It wasn't like uh, he got a little bit in the hole and couldn't pay off his credit cards. This was like a huge sum of money did, that he did he file for bankruptcy or did, was that did. forced on him oh he, he filed did. he it. did and that was the yeah. final judgment was in the range of of uh 25 million 26 million i think it was and holy moly yeah well and i mean and if so uh this is a guy that you know is going to be in our town um and you know with with well i don't want to get into the nuts and bolts of it but there's a lot of things to sort of on the personal level of uh you know, tabs not paid and stuff like that. Well, uh, I want the restaurateurs and have, have their tabs paid and things like that. He needs to come in and set a great example. And there's a huge pressure on him to do so. And hopefully that will carry the day for uh, for this time. And well, know, if you wanted to come, if you wanted to come to the city where there's going to be five hundred thousand people looking over his shoulder, he picked the mm -hmm. right one. <laughs> he picked mm -hmm. the right one. Yeah. All right. So, See from a hockey goes. perspective, uh, the Oilers have added left wingers uh, Ryan Nugent Hopkins on Tuesday, Zach Hyman on Thursday, and very possibly Evander Kane on Saturday, uh, with Dylan Holloway warming up in the bullpen. And uh, all of a sudden, a, a position that was kind of a weak link on this team, and certainly was during the time Hyman and Nugent Hopkins were unavailable, uh, as, uh, as looking pretty deep they could all four guys that started the game uh last saturday that won the game against calgary they could be on the outside looking in before too long yeah and on the right side yes a pulley rb starting to play like a beast if you ask me all right two good things each two bad mm -hmm. things two numbers what's your good thing bruce my good thing number one i'm going to go with Mikko koskinen i thought he was thought uh, he was very Fine again tonight. He faced uh, 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 a lot of tough shots and a lot of tough shots in, in uh, difficult situations where, you know, a, a goal against would have put the Oilers in a bad spot. And I didn't think, you know, the two goals that cleanly beat him were great shots by, you know, uh, top scorers from uh, from Nashville. You know, it was, uh, I think it was Forsberg's 22nd and Duchesne's 21st of the season. I mean, it's two 20 goal scorers at the sort of halfway point of the season and they sniped and they sniped a few other times too. And he stopped those ones and he stopped a few others. And, and uh, I thought, especially after um, Nashville made it two one, and there was a few minutes there between before Edmonton tied it up kind of out of the blue, but where Nashville had a series of pretty dangerous chances. And if they make it three, one, it's good night, Irene. And I, they never did get that third goal, just like Vancouver. They just got, <clears throat> they got the two, and there they stopped. And uh, uh, Koskinen, in addition to the, I guess, 12 saves he made off of grade-A shots in regulation time, was three for three in the shootout with a couple of humdingers in there as well. And, and uh, full credit to him, uh, named third star in the building as uh, uh, one of the key reasons why others came away with the two points again. Three games in a row. Yeah, it speaks to the caution that Ken Holland has to have in making a trade because he has to get someone who's better than Koskinen. And Koskinen is, I think it's fair to say he's streaky. <laughs> think, Very fair. I think we can say that. He's streaky. Uh, man, the, 
he made a couple saves with five minutes left in the third period, point blank saves off that Geno guy. Tanner Geno. Uh, yeah, geez. Pulley Arby got beat out of the cor- kind of didn't uh, stop the guy or out of the corner. So Lagasin goes in there, leaves Geno right in front of the net, and two point blank chances mm-hmm. that uh, are pounded off Koskinen's pads. And then he makes, um, with a minute 30 left in overtime, there's a breakaway. And he stones, I can't remember who it was, he stones that shooter. And then we saw the full three meters of the man spread out on the ice in the shootout to stop Duchesne's incredible chance. Mm-hmm. That was that was wonderful. And um, it's, it is it is great to see Miko Koskinen do well. I'm, if I'm completely honest, I've, I've soured on him a little. I've lost some trust mm-hmm. in Koskinen's ability. Um, he often looks awkward on the ice. Yep. Nope. Um, but he can he can come up he can come up big. I think he is a backup NHL goalie. Mm-hmm. I think that's fair to say. Like he can, I don't know what his save percentage is now, but it's probably above nine hundred. Over nine hundred after tonight because he uh, he was rocking about a nine thirty five. I think tonight. Yeah. So good for him. Nine thirty three, I guess. I'm gonna go with my first good thing. Uh, Bruce says puck luck. And it's something the Oilers really didn't get a whole heck of a lot of during the, their losing streak. They really didn't. No. They just they just couldn't. You know, they, they regularly had a few more. One, you know, they averaged about one more grade A shot on game than the other team. But they just couldn't get any luck. They couldn't get one. And, and UC Saros, UC, is it UC Saros or UC? He, he had a hell of a game. That's a hell of a he goaltender. Did. I really liked how he looked in that. Terrific. Man, good. He, um, we were talking about Trechak the other night and mm-hmm. he looked like Trechak to me, just so solid and square on that, like a, you know, like a crab. Um, anyway, the Oilers were having trouble. They were getting all kinds of grade A shots this game and having trouble scoring. And then finally, Evan Bouchard launches one from the point. And mm-hmm. I think it initially goes off someone's stick right away, yeah. starts bouncing. And then it goes off Johansson's skate in front of the net and it goes in the net. And it, and the, it made it 2-2 with uh, five minutes left in the second period, ties it up going into the third period. Just absolutely crucial, critical moment in the game, big goal. Mm-hmm. And what a beauty Puck Luck is. When she finally shows up, she is the most beautiful thing you're going to see. <laughs> Other than a Connor McDavid rush or a Leon Dreisaitl one-timer. Puck Luck is so fine. So yeah. wonderful. Well, we were saying not long ago, when was the last time the Oilers got a junky goal of any description? Yeah. And then McLeod got that one on the short side uh, uh, the other night. You know, the, the goalie made 20 great saves, but he let that one in. And then tonight they finally got the old double banker that goes in the net. And it seems like we've seen 10 goals against like that. I mean, Toronto got two in one period like that, for God's sake. And then in the game in Toronto in early January, and they, you know, they won that game by one goal, essentially. And that was happening too often. So uh, we'll take that bounce. You know, tying goal, David, they don't come any bigger in Gary Bettman's NHL than the game tying goal because they're worth, on mathematical average, 1.5 standing points because you get one for the tie and then you get a 50% chance at the third point in the overtime because you got the tie. And tonight they got to, you know, actually got the full two points. Without that goal, they lose two to one. So, you know, that game tying goal has, uh, you know, Statistically, uh, uh, any way you choose to measure it, it has more value than any other goal in the game. Yeah, and maybe even more to the Oilers, at least the way they're playing in overtime right now, because they're stomping. So, yeah, yeah, Fortuna finally showed up. All right, uh, what is your second good thing, Bruce? I'm going to go with Darnell Nurse, and this was uh, this was just general impressions. I thought this was the best he's looked in a game for a long time. Like he really bossed it. And he started, the longer the game went on, the more and more he took over. And he was just easily winning one-on-one battles against uh, Nashville forwards and, and erasing them from the play or easily winning races to the puck and m- making good decisions with it to get it out of harm's way. And he, uh, uh, I, you know, he skated so well in this game and he played 28 minutes and 47 seconds. And... He had the Oilers outshot in his 22 minutes at evens. The Oilers outshot Nashville 19 to 12. 
And the nurse himself had nine shot attempts, five hits, two block shots, a takeaway, a giveaway. He was all over the score sheet. And the only bad thing was the chintzy penalty he got uh, when he was on the receiving end of a dirty hit and he got up and he kind of gave the guy a light tap in the skate. And somehow the ref who'd missed the initial hit was uh, was uh, all, well, I got to call that retaliatory slash. I can't even call it a slash. It was a slash. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, I was a little annoyed at that moment because I'd already nailed Pugliarvi for a legit tripping penalty, but about five seconds after him, after Pugliarvi himself had legit been tripped and starting things. It's going to be one of those games. So. Sure felt like anyway, that. <clears throat> nurse, nurse rebounded from that, and his teammates killed the penalty. And if I had a third good thing, it would be the penalty kill that killed three for three without a shot, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's funny. Nurse, I'm going to make a perhaps odd comparison for Nurse and Bouchard when they're together because they don't physically look like these two players. But stylistically, I, I'm a big European soccer fan, and they remind me of Andre Pirlo and Gennari Gattuso, uh, the great AC Milan combination and midfielder, midfield. With Gattuso, okay. the kind of the cop who would regularly boss the game with his physicality and his and his dynamic play. And Pirlo, this incredible mad bomber uh, mm -hmm. with passes. And that's how I, I see Nurse and Bouchard, you know, they're much lankier physically, but that's in terms of style. That's I see Bouchard as the Pirlo and uh, Nurse as the Gattuso. And and hopefully, you know, able to, you know, th that was the word with Gattuso, how he bossed the game again and mm -hmm. again and again. And Nurse did that tonight. He certainly did it in overtime. And he's capable he did, of huh? doing that for, he's capable of doing it for the next five, six, seven years in Edmonton um, in, in the prime of his career coming up here. So the Oilers could be, you know, it's, we still don't know with Bouchard which way he's going to go, like, the, the confidence of young players, the development of young players is uncertain, fragile. Um, but that's, you know, that's the upper end of of what I'm hoping for is that kind of just solid combination play from those two players together. And, you know, it's Bouchard's been there the last couple games and, and it has not worked out well for the right side demon playing with Nurse because it's a tough job playing all those hard minutes. He did a little better tonight. Um, he's, mm -hmm. he's certainly getting, you know, his, his, uh, mojo back, really moving the puck. He's looking really good with the puck on his stick. I like him on the power play. Bruce, my yeah, second he made one nice rush tonight where he came oh, back yeah. and he picked off a pass and he just went right up the middle through about four guys and fired a nice shot that tested, tested, uh, Saros. And he like nurse had a not with crooked numbers right across the event summary, every column except face-offs, which don't apply to defensemen. They each had a scoring point. They each had a penalty. They, you know, they're just all over the, all over the score sheet, and uh, uh, that's a pretty dynamic pairing when they're on their game. My second good thing was Connor McDavid. He was just flying tonight, and in in terms of our assessment of his play on at least on grade A shots, which is kind mm -hmm. of pretty big event in, in a game. It's a great yep. A shot. He was in on 12 of them. Oh. He didn't make a mistake on any, Bruce. Wow. We didn't have him on any. Wow. No mistakes. 12, like, so plus 12 on grade A shots. Ooh. That's a nine. Like, I don't know what Kurt's mm -hmm. going to give, but he he just was fantastic in this game. Mm -hmm. And um, who do they have him with? Uh, Yamo and Nuge again? Is yes. that it? Yeah. You know, he's, he's with some skilled players here mm -hmm. and he's going to be with some skilled players all year long and they don't have to be Leon Dreisaitl anymore. So it's exciting. This is exciting again. Three game winning streak and uh, McDavid with his, you know, getting it back, getting his A game back after not having it for a while there. So possibly related to being sick. So well, he made a brilliant rush to tie the game in the last minute of the first period mm -hmm. and Nugent Hopkins and uh, uh, Nurse made the play in front of Oilers' net, and McDavid had to reach back to grab the puck and then drop it in his own path. And then he, away he went against poor Matt Benning one on one. And I thought Benning did an all right job of, of driving him outside, but uh, McDavid was somehow able to force that shot through Saros. And lest we forget the shootout. Or one yeah. goal was scored, and McDavid absolutely 
completely bamboozled UC Saros. My goodness, he's just standing over there tapping the puck into the net, you know, with the goalie over there in the corner. I'm just going to tap it home. You know? Oh, man. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to make a play oh. like that once, just once in your life, Bruce? Go down the ice and stick out of like that. Like, what lightning, oh. what lightning hands? You know, in the overtime, he had three rushes, mm-hmm. three rushes that just sliced open the other team and led to, you know, great scoring opportunities. Two of them ended up in shots, and we think one of them, Hyman, didn't get his stick on. But right. um, just, he, just they, they, you know, as the cliche goes, they had no answer for Connor McDavid in overtime. They really didn't. He's right. just too fast, too good, too tough mm-hmm. for those wingtip bozos, as they said once said on Crime Story. He looked a little shaken up. He took a shot off the foot, yeah. and I'll be happier when I hear it that tomorrow he's out on the ice for practice and everything's normal because you never know what happens when the guy takes a skate off. But uh, yeah. uh, hopefully that's just me being over sensitive that something might have happened there. But he was limping a little bit and, and for a little bit of game time, but. He certainly didn't appear to have slowed down all that much. So, What's your bad thing, Bruce? Yeah, I'm going to go with this weird play where actually nothing happened, but it's more what could have happened and when it happened and how it never should have happened when it happened. This is a play with two minutes left in the third period, and just as Jack Michaels is saying, and down the stretch they come in. So... Uh, the Oilers line is out there, and they've actually got pretty good possession in, in uh, Nashville territory. It's Dreisaitl with uh, Fogel and Pugliarvi, and Keith and Cece are on the blue line. And at the end of the of this, of the cycle, which was a fairly long one, uh, Keith shot one into traffic that didn't get through the traffic in front of the net. And as Nashville sort of recovered the play and a couple of their players went to the bench for a line change and all three orders forwards kind of drooped their shoulders and started coasting to the Edmonton bench. And now we've got <laughs> CC and Keith and three forwards that aren't even looking at the puck because they're all <sighs> each fall. Like the third guy, which was Fogel, had to be sort of watching his line mates saying, I better stay out here and guard the right side and make my change when I can. So now Keith and Cece come over to guard the right side because the def- the forwards are all changing on the left side. And the Nashville defenseman looks up and he fires about a 100-foot pass that hits Matt Duchesne right on the tape, right on the Edmonton blue line, 20 feet behind the Oilers defenseman who are at the center red line. Two minutes left, tie game in regulation time. And the puck hits Duchesne's stick and it hops off his stick and it skitters ahead of him and he can't control it and make a play. But if the puck hits his stick, he's got a clear-cut breakaway with 2-2 tie, two minutes left in regulation, where a goal is a killer. And it takes away your stand. Like, there, you got to be cautious. you got to be paying attention. And your coach has got to be all over that and calling it out because, you know, a, a, a successful team just doesn't pull off crap like that. Uh, it's like I say, nothing came of it, but I, I ran the replay a few times. And I, I mean, Duchesne, he had the puck on his stick and, and Keith was still in the circle. And Kane was, or um, Duchesne was on the blue line with the puck over the blue line and 20 feet behind me. Kane, nobody would have caught Duchesne on that play. And you got to be keeping track. And the forwards weren't and the defensemen weren't. And it was nearly a five-man blunder that, you know, would have had us. It would have been our, yeah, I, well, I guess it still is our first bad thing, but we would have been talking about a lot earlier in the podcast. So, Yeah, I've got, um, Keith was in on that one. I've got Duncan Keith as my bad thing, two particular plays in the second period. And I know, like, you know, they, like they say, the, the legs go as you get older. Well, but the mind shouldn't, like the, the head should be there in the game. And these are two mental mistakes. You know, the, and again, like what, one of my favorite sayings now is hockey happens fast because when mm-hmm. you're playing it, it really does. And yep. bad things happen so fast. Yep. So you got to be really reading the game well and and on top of it. And and on the first play, it's uh, Nashville's, I think it's their second goal of the game. And um, yeah, their second goal of the game. Matt Duchesne just sneaks in behind him and gets the pass, goes in, cuts in the middle and snipes in an incredible, it's a two on one and he snipes in a shot. And, um, you know, Duncan Keith's got to be thinking, how did, how did I let that happen? 
Mm-hmm. H- how did that happen? Like he's a veteran defenseman. He's played more than a thousand NHL games in a top pairing role. Mm-hmm. How does he let someone just sneak in so cleanly behind him? You know, it will happen now and then, but it's happened a lot. Mm-hmm. And so that's one thing. And, and then literally uh, 45 seconds later, he, after that goal is scored, he's, he's still out there yeah. and he tries to, again, he, he makes a, you know, he tries to keep the puck in the, the Chicago end, maybe trying to make up for his early mistake. And it leads to a three on one this mm-hmm. time. And, um, just an absolutely massive, huge save by Miko Koskinen, which would have been a killer. No. Yeah. And like, no, I don't know. He's just, just. Take care of defense first. Like I know they want him to, to mm-hmm. be an offensive hockey player. His offense comes when he gets the puck on his stick in his D zone, gets his head up and makes a great pass. Duncan Keith is still a really fine hockey player in that moment. Yep, but there has been right. too many defensive mistakes and these were two mental ones, two mental mm-hmm. errors. And, um, you know, it wasn't terrible. He wasn't, he didn't have a bad game. I don't know mm-hmm. what I give him if I grade him. Like he, he was, right. he made some good plays. But those two plays, it's like you're the veteran. Yeah. You're this. You're the savvy veteran. Okay, be the savvy veteran. Savvy, 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 savvy veteran. Mm-hmm. Uh, be the savvy veteran, and don't let, don't give up odd man rushes because mm-hmm. of mental mistakes. Well, the owners had seven official giveaways in this game, and three of them were charged to Duncan Keith. Yeah. So it wasn't just uh, guys were getting behind him, which happened. Those two plays that you described and the one play I described, but uh, three other times where he had the puck and coughed it up. Now, one of them, a guy made a good play to knock a pass out of the air, turn it around. But uh, uh, anyway, it was uh, not his finest hour. I, I don't think he stunk, but, uh, you know, there were issues. Your number. Yeah, I'm going to go with the number four. And this number of shots on net that the Oilers' leading shooter had tonight. And the Oilers' leading shooter was Duncan Keith, four shots, Zach Hyman, four shots, Darnell Nurse, four shots, Leon Dreisaitl, four shots, Warren Fogel, four <laughs> shots, uh, Zach Cassian, four shots. That doesn't happen too often. Uh, Evan Bouchard, four shots, and Connor McDavid, four shots. Eight different Oilers, four wow. shots each, and two more with three with Cody CC and Ryan Nugent Hopkins. They were peppering pucks, but it was a real team effort. It was, you know, like last game, it was like Leon had 11, and we, you know, we had some kind of outrageous, crooked numbers. Well, tonight it was sort of coming from across, uh, across the lineup of uh, of guys getting their getting their chances and taking them and getting pucks on net. And so it was uh, it was a more more of a balanced uh, uh, attack in this game. That's pretty remarkable. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you see that very often. No. Okay, my number, Bruce, is 1.55. And that's Leon Dreisaitl's game goal uh, points per game. Uh, points per games played. So he's mm-hmm. now, I think this is up. How many games have they played? Was that 39? This is 39, yep. Oh, this stuck, isn't an updated. It's going to be down a little he's bit. He's stuck on that. 59 points, so he'd be yeah. 1.52 or something. Yeah, it's going to be down. Anyway, um, he and McDav- McDavid's at 1.54 heading into the game. He was at 1.55. Mm-hmm. And um, they lead the league in mm-hmm. points per game. And let me just see here. I think Leon's the lead leader, and he's tied with Huberto. <laughs> I don't know why they have him. Like, they have Huberto in number one, but Leon's played – five less games. So um, these guys are, I think they had a higher points per game. Yeah, they had a higher points per game last season. They've been really cool, um, relatively cool in the last, during the Oilers' poor streak, honestly. So Mm -hmm. so that's how long it lasted. Leon was exactly 1.5. He had 84 points in 56 games. So he's right there. And Connor had, was it 1.8? He was way higher. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was uh, one. Yeah, it was, it was way higher. 1.8. 1.8. Yeah. So um, let's hope they s- start their assault again on the uh, the Art Ross Trophy standings. They're both uh, right at the top of the league in terms of points per game. So they are the, the two top scorers in the NHL. And um, 
I think I think we're going to see some good things, Bruce. I think you know um, Brian Lott was on the radio <sighs> talking about the need to trade. He thought for uh, Mark Andre Fleury, and just but really what came through was his confidence in this team. He really thinks this team is a good team and is ready to get going again. And it wasn't as bad as it looked. And I I really agreed with that assessment. According to our grade A shots, that's accurate. What he was saying that when they were losing as much as they were, they weren't as bad as that looked. It was for a number of factors Um, and could have won a few few more points at least uh, during that that spree with better puck luck, some better goaltending, things like that. He does think they have a hole in net. I think I think I agree with that. I won't speak for you, but he's pretty. He's very bullish on the team. That's what came through to me, and and mainly because of McDavid and Drysaitel, he's right to be bullish. And they finally have truly. There there can be no one who can say they haven't finally at least in in the top six surrounded McDavid and Drysaitel with some excellent wingers, mm-hmm. with with Kane arriving, with Nuge, with Hyman. Pulley RV with Yamamoto. There's a there's a lot of options with even Fogel. There's a lot of options up there, and um, they don't have to play together. They can play with other players, and and they should be able to get stuff done at even strength. And they can work together on the power play. So I'm looking forward to this next run of games. Of course, I'm riding the high of a three game winning streak. I will admit that, but uh, and three rather remarkable wins. Nonetheless, Bruce sees it. These really are two spectacular players. There is no choice but to be all in right now. When you have these two players at this point in their career, you, you do make a trade for a goalie. You do make a trade and you bring in a left defenseman. Um, maybe even to play second pairing if Keith doesn't get his act together better. So like you go for it here. And um, the addition of Kane is is a step in that direction uh, on the ice. So. Yeah, I'm interested to see where, if they're going to use Kane in the net front position in the power play, if that just means to pull Yarby and, and Hyman, who have both been good in their role, uh, just get sort of bumped aside or how that works out. And I'm also interested to see uh, how the how they'll do the lines. Will Nugent Hopkins default to 3C if, you know, because... Looking at the lines that we saw tonight, it's not too hard to see Kane moving into the line with McDavid. I guess he could move into Fogel's spot with uh, um, with um, uh, Drysaddle. And Pulley Arvin. You could have Hyman. Hyman really looked great. Like, finally, they had a third line, mainly because of Zach Hyman, I thought. Like, he really drove that line. And they got much better performance out of it with McLeod yeah. and Cassian. So... Maybe that's something that we're going to see. I think we're going to see lots of different. Listen, what we see, Bruce, <laughs> you know, we see this. All kinds of different line combinations. Like he, 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 he now and then will stick with one line combination for for months on end. Mm-hmm. But generally, we see the blender, and I, I bet you we see the blender for quite a while. And um, I really hope if you know, Kane has got to come in and earn that power play time. Personally, he's got to earn it at even strength. I don't want to see him on the first game on the power play. I don't think we, like, I'd be surprised if we did. Puglia Yarvi has been fantastic there. And yeah. Hyman has been very good. So, you know, that said, if they finally move Puglia Yarvi to the penalty kill and get some extra ice time for him yeah. there, that would work for me too. So, I don't think Kane's a penalty killer, is he? He is. Is he? Yeah, he does oh, really? everything. Yeah. Oh geez. Yeah. Well, there's there. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I'm. Uh, I've heard people talking about it, and I'm sure I remember him. I mean, I'm not sure if he's a top unit guy, but uh, he's out there, and he can be a threat because he's fast and you know skilled. So. I don't really like. I've seen him play all these years. I don't have a strong, imp- like a huge impression of him as a player. Like honestly, you know, other than a, you know, the odd play. Like some players really stand out. Uh, for their hustle and their skill, you know, but I don't have a, I'll, I'll be interested to watch his game more closely and see what he brings and doesn't bring and see how solid he is as a defender. He has um, 14 career shorthanded goals. Okay. And that's pretty scored good. At least one shorthanded goal in nine of the last 10 seasons, which tells me, you know, just that's the stat that's available to me. But if you looked up ice time, you don't score shorthanded goals unless you're out there a little bit. For sure. You know. <laughs> uh, so he's uh, 
he's you know he's a, a threat shorthanded and and he's an alternative an option that they can add to the to the cycle to the mix so and they're going to need penalty killers because some of these fourth line grinders you know as as the roster continues to flush out and guys get healthy there's going to be people falling off the end of that roster there will for instance and i think you can have like i i, I think you can have Derek ryan on your team or you can have colton sevier on your team but i don't think a good team has ne- both like uh, every night probably not. every night no i think they have one of one guy like that and uh i'm fine with it if it's either of those guys because they're both good good players in that role mm-hmm. but um yeah we're gonna see a drop off for a lot of players who've been getting ice time they're not going to get much and they're not going to get games the, the battle the battle all up and down the roster for ice time just gets really intense now with with evander kane arriving Ideally, they they balance it out a little bit. I mean, tonight's all too typical. You know, Nurse twenty nine minutes, Drysaddle twenty seven and a half minutes, McDavid twenty six minutes. Night after night after night, that takes a toll. And if you could cut even a couple of minutes off, especially those forwards, and you know, you still obviously lean on them very heavily, but twenty three minutes as opposed to twenty six or twenty eight. And if you got to, if you've got good depth and all the way down at least through nine uh your top nine then you can afford to do that a little bit so i don't have a strong feeling about it honestly like i know that there's a whole science evolving around this about optimum ice time and and uh, recovery time and what players can do over a period of time and perhaps i'm a little old school you know having watched gretzky play whatever he and messier play i wish they kept ice time in those days yeah i sure would love to know that stuff so i I probably stuck in the past and i don't put as much weight on this as probably people should like you know the modern world would put more they would look at this really closely look at it scientifically and say you know to get peak performance out of him he should not be playing you know this smaller amount of ice time that he's playing now that's probably the case, but I guess I'm I guess I'm sanguine about it because of you know having seen that where players played just played and played and played. I although watching McDavid and Drysaddle, especially in overtime, I'm often thinking like get out, get the hell off the ice already before you yeah, well, before you yeah. gas out and they score a goal against you because we've seen that too much. I've not seen the player yet that has sort of VO two of Wayne Gretzky. Like no he play all night. That was that was unreal. His recovery. But yeah. I mean, Peter Zosky's book, they talk about him in the training camp just sort of breaking the machine that measured the VO2 recovery where they just couldn't believe that that he had, you know, have his breath back within 10 seconds of pausing to catch it. You know, it was like off the charts. I, I was thinking McDavid tonight was pretty incredible in overtime, the way he could keep going and going and going and going fast. Mm-hmm. You really, I really notice it with Leon when Leon's out there for more than a minute. He really slows down. And, um, but with McDavid this time, at least in overtime, he just seemed to have his legs all night long and could just keep flying. So both those guys are playing better. You know, we're just, I think days away from returning to, uh, what we're accustomed to, which is games where both guys have two, three points sort of as a routine. Lately, it's been one point or zero for both guys, most games. And the odd, Leon had that one four point game. There was the Calgary game where they each got they each got assists on the two Bouchard goals on the power play, but you know, but there there was uh, uh, they're they're starting to do the process and they're not getting really rewarded for it yet, but it's going to come. Well, in the last most two guys games, are, are going to score. In the last two games, Bruce, um, mm-hmm. Drysaddle's been on on like twenty one grade A shots. And um, McDavid's been in on 26. 14 and 12, 26. So normally that would, that would bring you six, seven points, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what does he have? Did he get two, two points? points? Yeah. So, he, you know, each game. He's, he's getting his chances, as they say, yeah. and the pucks will go in and they started. They, he got one tonight. Bruce, let's, uh, let's leave it there. I guess we'll be talking on Saturday night. Yeah, I don't know if Kane will be in the lineup, but I, I'm my, my position is I'm withholding judgment, and I'm going to just try and judge him on what he does on the ice in terms of how we cover it. But uh, it'll be an interesting uh, uh, 
interesting experiment that the team has undertaken here, and, and it's uh, very high in the risk reward front. Indeed. All right, let's leave it there. Thanks for talking tonight, Bruce. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.